In this video, I'm going to start discussing Bell's inequality, or sometimes called Bell's theorem, which is a proof that your quantum mechanical theory cannot have what are called local hidden variables. And so that's what I'll start getting into today. So let's say we have two particles, and particle one's z spin can then be represented in the superposition of states here where we have spin up and spin down and particle 2 likewise can also be represented as a superposition of the spin up and spin down in the z directions. And then we can also have these entangled such that both particles are represented by a single wave function. And so this component right here is if we have particle 1 in the spin up and particle 2 in the spin down. And this one, we have particle 1 in the spin down and particle 2 in the spin up, both in the z direction. And likewise, the two particles in the singlet state can be represented in the x basis as well. And we see that this takes the same form as we saw for the z spin. And so that is what allows us to do this analysis here. So what the equations predict and what is confirmed in experiments is that if, say, Alice measures particle 1 to be spin state z plus, so the spin up state, then she knows regardless of how far away Bob is, if he measures his particle, it will be in the spin down state. But we can explain this pretty easy, can't we? Let's say Alice and Bob have a pair of shoes. Some third person, Eve, puts one of each of the pair into separate boxes without Alice or Bob knowing which shoe goes in which box. Eve then hands each of them one of the boxes. Alice and Bob leave in opposite directions, getting millions of miles away from each other. Alice then opens her box and finds that she has the left shoe. And so instantaneously she knows that Bob has the right shoe. So what is so baffling about this? I mean, this seems pretty mundane, doesn't it? And we could think of it the same way with our particles. So if Alice measures her particle in the up direction, then it must have been that Bob had his particle in the down direction the whole time, his measurement simply revealing this fact. And it even makes sense that the particles would be anti-correlated, so meaning that one is spin up, meaning it has to be that the other one is spin down and vice versa. Since we must preserve angular momentum, and so the spin up plus spin down angular momenta are just a result of both particles being entangled from a zero angular momentum starting state. And so if you have a zero angular momentum starting state and you split it off into two in order to preserve angular momentum, so the conservation of angular momentum, one would have to be spinning in the up state and the other in the down state in order to cancel each other out and get back to that zero angular momentum. So this, of course, is a naive EPR-like hidden variable view of things, that our measurements reveal some pre-existing fact about the system, and in particular, some pre-existing fact about the system that was prepared or communicated ahead of time, so when they were in causal contact with each other, so preserving that locality. But as we've established, this is not the case since measurements are contextual, meaning that we can't think about it in this, this analogy of the shoe that I was talking about because when we do a measurement, it has to be contextual as demanded by the Koch and Specker theorem. Bell's inequality, also as I said, often called Bell's theorem, is a test of this sort of hidden variable theory, which are known as local hidden variables, since it assumes locality. As I said, we have particle 1 in the plus or minus 1 spin state in the z and x direction, likewise for particle 2. This means that we can predict these following outcomes. And so if we have particle 1, so this again is assuming these local hidden variables. So particle 1 before any measurement is definitely in the plus 1 z spin and plus 1 x spin. That must mean that particle 2 is in the minus 1 z spin and minus 1 x spin. And then we can go through each of these combinations here and each one should have a frequency of 25%. 
So in this table, we can see that a particle of any particular pair type must already possess definite spins prior to measurement. These are our local hidden variables. And I'll keep stressing this local part here because this is really the thing that Bell's theorem is about. I think, and this is something that I'll talk about in later videos, a lot of people and a lot of very prominent physicists seem to think that Bell's theorem rules out any sort of hidden variables theory, but it really only rules out local hidden variables. But anyway, so if particle 1, as I said, has a z spin of plus 1 and an x spin of minus 1, even prior to any measurement, then 2 better have a z spin of minus 1 and an x spin of plus 1, even prior to any measurement if we were to obtain these frequencies here. For, say, if we measure the x spin of particle 1 and the z spin of particle 2, we get a 25% probability for each. And so that's represented by this linear combination right here. These frequencies can easily be predicted by an EPR-like local hidden variables theory. But does this work in general? For instance, what if we do not use orthogonal angles, and what if we use more than two different angles. For instance, what if we use the directions A, B, and C, so these are the entangled states for each of these. We now end up with eight pair types that have frequencies represented by these F right here, these F sub 1, F sub 2, and so on, up to F sub 8. And so we can have all of these possible combinations for our A, B, and C spin directions. And so this, you know, is starting to look a little bit complicated, but what we see here is just that each of these, again, have to be opposite. So if the particle 1 is plus 1 in all states, then particle 2 has to be negative 1 in all states. If particle 1 is plus 1 in the A and B spin, then negative 1 in C spin, then particle 2 has to be negative 1 in A and B spin, and then plus 1 in C spin, and so on and so forth. And we have to have that all of these frequencies here add up to 1 because we are looking at probabilities here. We can see, for instance, that if we measure particle 1 in the A direction and particle 2 in the B direction, then the probability of both being in the plus 1 direction is this. So it's the F3 plus F5. And we can see that by highlighting these here. So only in the F3 and then the F5, can we get that the A spin of particle 1 is plus 1 and the B spin of particle 2 is plus 1. And so we have to get F3 plus F5 in order for A and B to be both positive like this. And so, like I said, since both F3 and F5 and in no other do we get that A and B in the spin up direction. And so likewise for B and C and for A and C, we can see that to get these both in the plus direction, we now have F2 plus F6 and F2 plus F5. And so I highlighted those in this table right here. And so it must be that we have this inequality right here, where the equality, because this is less than or equal to, would be if F3 is 0 and F6 is 0, because then we'd just get rid of this and this, and we'd have F2 plus F5 equals F5 plus F2. And that's because all of our frequencies here have to be between 0 and 1 inclusive. And this is just the same as saying that we have this, so this is our probability of A, C being both positive, which is our F2 plus F5 is less than or equal to our A, B, being both positive, plus our B, C being both positive. Now, in general, spin along some n-axis where this is at sort of an arbitrary angle, so that's an angle theta from the z-axis is given by this right here. So if we're talking about non-orthogonal states, then these are the angles here, this theta. And then getting the z-direction in terms of the n-direction, we end up with these right here which gives us this as our singlet state for the z direction and some arbitrary n direction, which tells us the probability of getting both as spin up state is this, so this will be our probability right here, which since we can just define the z direction to be any direction we want, 
This means that we can this works in general whenever our two directions have an angle theta from each other. So let's say that our B is in the Z direction, then the directions of A and C are angled theta from B in opposite directions. So we get something that looks like this, where this is our B direction, and then C is some angle theta from that, and then A is some angle, I guess, negative theta from that. And so A and C are both two theta from each other. And so recall our inequality here that we were talking about. And so we now have this. So the AB being both plus plus is this angle theta right here. So remember, we have A to B being an angle theta from each other. We have B and C here, which are this angle theta from each other, B to C. And so then the angle A to C would now be 2 theta. So this 2 and this 2 will cancel out, and we get this right here meaning that our inequality then becomes this, where we have this one here that had the two theta angle, and so these ones both still have that theta over two angle. But this inequality is not true when theta is less than pi over two, which we can see here if we plot these in Desmos, that when we get below this right here, which is around 1.57, we see that it is actually the case that this one is greater than this one. So that is not true. The biggest violation is at pi over 3, which is going to be a little bit above 1. So we can see that that is the biggest distance between those. And so at pi over 3, we get our, our sine functions here being 1 over 8, 1 over 8, and then 3 over 8 for the double angle. And clearly, 3 over 8 is not less than 1 over 8 plus 1 over 8. So 3 over 8 is not less than 2 over 8. And so we get a contradiction. And so that is the Bell's theorem. So what this ultimately means is that if is the case that the inequality here is shown to be experimentally true, then this would be a refutation of quantum mechanics. And I capitalize it here to say that we're sort of talking about textbook quantum mechanics. So it would be a refutation of the non-locality of quantum mechanics and a vindication of local hidden variables. If instead the measure of probability is violated the above inequality, such as what we would see right here, then this would be a refutation of local hidden variables. And as it turns out, experiments of this kind, so these are some very early experiments of this kind, there have been plenty of other ones that have come after that, violate this inequality, thus refuting local hidden variables. And so the largely agreed upon conclusion from this is that a theory of quantum mechanics must not contain any local hidden variables. There are some caveats here that I'm going to get into in a future video about things like parameter independence, but like I said, the largely agreed upon conclusion from this is that a theory of quantum mechanics must not contain any local hidden variables. And so let's think about this more concretely. We can run an experiment that has two arms, each with its own apparatus that randomly chooses one of the following directions, A, B, or C. So that's what I'm showing here. So we have our source of particles. These are the trajectories of particles one and two that are entangled with each other. And then these right here are randomly chosen stern gerlach magnets. So we could have this B1 move down, and then we are preparing in the B direction. We could have this C1 move in, and then we're preparing it in the C direction, with this A1 moving in and measuring it in the A direction. And we could do that at part at detector two as well. And this is random, so we could have the B1 here, then the A1 over at detector 2, or we can have the B1 over here, the C1 over at detector 2. and So we should get a mixture of each of these combinations here. And so that's what we are looking at here in this first look at a form of testing Bell's inequality. So we have the spin preparation devices angled at 120 degrees from each other. So between each of these is 120 degrees, adding up to the full 360 degrees. 
And so in the Z basis, they are each represented by this. So this is A in the Z basis right here. This is B in the Z basis, which is just the same as our Z right here, which is just one and a zero. Then the C in the Z basis is this right here. And we can calculate the expectation value of the Born rule for the probability that these would end up with a spin in the same direction. And so if we run those calculations for each, we see that we get one fourth for each of these thus obtaining the expectation value for each as being one-fourth. But if we look at a hidden variables theory, we would predict this. And so what we want to look at is where we have these possibilities of same and different. And so we have that the probability for the same is going to be equal to one-third. So if we averaged over all trials of this type, we'd get one-third. And then we could add in these pure up and pure down where it's always the same. And so that's why I put here that it's going to be greater than or equal to one third. But we saw above that we calculated one fourth. And so one fourth is clearly greater than or clearly less than one third. And so this right here is a contradiction and so if this is what we actually find then we cannot have a local hidden variables theory of quantum mechanics and so that's essentially what bell's theorem or bell's inequality is showing and this is like i said a prediction if quantum mechanics is true then we would actually see this one fourth probability rather than this one third and then subsequent experiments have shown that this is actually true, that we actually get what we would expect from quantum mechanics rather than what we would expect from local hidden variables. And so that's why Bell's inequality is seen as a refutation of local hidden variables. In the next video, I'm going to go through another form of this. And so we'll actually come to the inequality that Bell actually really did come to. So this is what uh, Travis Norson called a toy model of Bell's inequality. But in the next video, we'll actually look at Bell's actual inequality. It really amounts to the same thing. And we'll also look at uh, what's called the CHSH inequality. And so that's really, it's kind of an expansion on Bell's inequality. And it's the thing that people actually test when they run these experiments. And part of that is for sort of logistical reasons, but I'll get into that in the next video. Uh, but anyway, I hope you found this video interesting, and I will see you in the next one.